Good morning again. My name is Kathy Shannon. I'm the Director of Communications and Engagement, whatever that means, right? Our, our new world titles, right? Um, with MDF, it's so good to see all of you in person. Uh, I'm, I'm emotional um, because it's, I've been looking forward to the opportunity to come out of my own loneliness and isolation. And I'm so happy to share that with all of you. And it's also, as my 87-year-old mother said, it's just a new version of weird, right? <laughs> we just keep dealing with yet another version of weird, right? So, so I'm wearing my mask only because my family is just getting over what we call the clinger cold, that it took us like five weeks to get over and four rounds of negative COVID tests, right? So it's, it's the brave new world, right? Uh, so I want to welcome you all to our time together. And as has been my practice and MDF's practice, um, I thought we could start out with some grounding breaths. And those of you who are going to be watching this uh, through the recording in the days and weeks to come, Take the time to do the grounding breaths with us. The purpose of the grounding breaths is to bring us together, to release any distractions we may have. And if you could take the, a moment to make sure that your cell phones are turned off, that they're somewhere away where they won't distract you. If you're watching us on the recording, maybe close a door or otherwise, begin to release any distractions because today we are focusing on advancing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion through systemic change in communities and across sectors. We are extremely grateful to our event sponsors, Woodard & Curran, Bangor Savings Bank, and Maine Biz for making this series of three symposiums possible. In the spirit of this work, we acknowledge that wherever we are physically in Maine, or in fact elsewhere in the world, well, in, at least in the United States and Canada, we are on unceded indigenous lands. In Maine, wherever we are physically, we are on the unceded lands of the Wabanaki or Abenaki people. We honor our indigenous partners as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. This is the third in a three-part series that was co-designed with a group of six dynamics leaders from across Maine. They are leading this work as individuals, as organizations, and in their communities as well as across economic sectors and systemically. Two of those six facilitators will lead today's session. Lisa Sockabasin, who is a co-CEO of Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, and Jennifer Hutchins, who's the Executive Director of Maine Association of Nonprofits. You are going to be energized and inspired by these two powerful women. So now let's take those grounding breaths that I talked about. If it's comfortable to you, you can close your eyes. And I invite you to focus on releasing any distractions, any fears, any frustrations that we may be carrying today. And let us begin to feel a collective energy of coming together for this critical work that we have together. So I invite you to breathe in and think of filling your lungs, your heart, maybe take another sip of air, 
fill your belly and try to envision filling your spine, your legs, and feel your feet grounded. And then as you release, hold it for a couple more seconds. As you release, try to release those fears, frustrations, and distractions. And we'll release together. Let's do two more. I invite you to breathe in. Feel your lungs, your heart, your bellies, your spine, your legs, and feel your feet grounded. And then release. And one more. I invite you to breathe in. Feel your bellies, your hearts, your spine, your legs, and let's feel our feet grounded. And then together release any frustrations, fears that the questions we might ask there is no stupid question. And this should be a space where we support each other to not only ask the questions, but to respectfully challenge each other in this critical work. And I invite you, when you're ready, to open your eyes if you have closed them and welcome into what we intend to be a safe, and brave space because we are together in this work even though we come with our own lived experience our own perspectives while we may be at different points along the path we are all on the path or else we wouldn't be here together today right some are just taking the first steps towards educating themselves or working with their, within their organizations or their communities towards JEDI. Some have been walking the walk for multiple miles and decades. And many of us have been involved and dedicated to it for our entire lives. Many of us are increasingly frustrated and weary that we still have work ahead when it comes to justice, equity, diversity and inclusion. It is my hope and MDF's hope that this cadre of leaders continues to work together in the years and decades moving forward. That we not only continue to invite more and more remainers to the table, but that we build a whole new table, in fact a whole new room. That five, ten years from now, we can say to our children and our grandchildren, I was there. I was part of that when Maine be became a model of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive culture and economy. Because if not us, then who? I am not willing to pass this along to my sons. I'm not willing to do that. And I know that you wouldn't be here if you weren't willing, if you were also not willing to pass it along. This is our work. Let's be brave together in this work. And my colleague Jan is going to talk a little bit more about making sure that this is a brave space as we move forward together. Jan, I think that's when I invite you up. <laughs> I, I was thinking you already said it. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Just hoping I don't fall off this table. Welcome, everyone. Uh, when I think about brave space, I don't know about you, how do you define the word courage? Honesty. Honesty. Strength. Strength. Trying. Trying. Risk-taking. Risk Excellent. When we talk about the word courage in our ICL program, Institute for Civic Leadership, and there are a few grads in here, we talk about courage being the courage of the heart, 
the courage to speak up, the courage to say what is in your heart about the issues we're facing, to say what I need to say to you, Sarah, or to you, Lisa, to help us move forward to, to work on the things that we need to work on together in Maine. So when we say courage, we're talking about courage of the heart. Uh, and sometimes that requires tough conversations. I don't know what the conversations will look like today. It depends upon you when we go into our small group um, after our speakers set us up for those conversations. But we're talking about that. At MDF, we are not experts. We are learners just like you. We are hosts for this conversation and we will continue to host it. We will continue to work on it until we get it right. And I'm not sure what that looks like yet because we're still working on it. Um, and we want to learn from you as well. And that's why we need this space where we feel that courage, that bravery to be able to talk so we get it right. So we are creating a space that's safe for everyone, that is respectful of everyone, that ensures that everyone uh, experiences um, the benefits of living in a space where they feel like they have the same rights, the same economic opportunity, all of those things. So we're inviting you into we're inviting you into a process to learn with us, okay? And we want to partner with you to make good things happen. And with that, Kathy, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to be brave. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce the first of our two speakers today. Lisa Sockabasin is a citizen of the Passamaquoddy tribe at, I hope I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it, at, I practice this, Lisa, Matamakumdakuk. Can you? Madatmakuk? Oh, Madatmakuk. Does everybody want to try saying it with me? Ready? It's Madotmacook. One more time, Madotmacook. Maybe a B plus? Yeah. <laughs> Lisa collaborates with tribal leadership, the Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness Team, and federal and philanthropic partners to address systemic inequities experienced by Wabanaki communities in Maine and to develop and implement culturally based programs that respond to the needs of our communities. She has served as the director of the Office of Health Equity in the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, as an epidemiologist in the Infectious Disease Program, excuse me, for the state of Maine, as a nurse epidemiologist with the North American Indian Center of Boston, and served for two decades as coordinator of the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard's Four Directions summer research program. Lisa holds a BS in biology from the University of Maine, a BS in nursing from the University of Maine, and an MS in health policy and management from the University of Southern Maine. She holds a graduate certificate in nonprofit management and serves on several boards, including Maine Philanthropy Center, Planned Parenthood of New England, the ACLU of Maine, and now the Maine Development Foundation. Welcome Lisa Sockabasin. So before I get started, just a few gratitudes. Um, don't start my time yet. <laughs> Kathy's going to help me with my time because this presentation I'm sharing with you could be a day, it could be an hour, and with Kathy's help, it's going to be 15 minutes. So, so we're going we're gonna to move through this as quickly as possible, but we're also going to make sure you have these slides if they're of interest to you. Um, and so Chi Willy One, thank you, Kathy and Jan. I also want to thank the people who greeted us at the front desk. Thank you for welcoming us. I also want to say a big thank you to the Ramada team for serving us, for making us feel nourished and comfortable. I also want to remind us all that it's Administrative Support People's Day. So I know Kathy said to put away your phones, but if you need to take care of some things right now, 
That is completely understandable. <laughs> and um, yeah, let's get started. I want to thank all of you, too. So I'm going to do what we do best in our culture and community is also, and also the organization that I lead. And let's tell a story. So this is a story. This is a story that is going to miss a lot of pieces. But I'm open for questions. And like how this has begun, any questions are questions that I want to hear. So this is a story about a global pandemic, a stretched, overstretched nonprofit sector. Can some people relate? and an indigenous nonprofit's journey through the complexities of what I just described. So some headlines. I wish we had a screen here, and then that might be easier for you. But essentially, these headlines probably are quite familiar, right? What happened to the workforce? What were the changes in our workplaces? What about this one? Is your business in a COVID coma? Workforce exhaustion and overwhelm. The great talent recession. Help wanted signs I'm sure you've seen everywhere. You might even have them in your own organizations and businesses. And then some headlines say, there's no end to this story. Let's move on. Industry and individuals. What we know is when bad things happen to us all, there are some people that are disproportionately impacted. We know that, right? You've had speakers before me probably talk about disparities and equities in our system, racism, classism, sexism. And here what we see is industries and certain individuals are disproportionately impacted. Single parents, women, minorities, young people. Why? Is it the industries that they have chosen or have the industries chosen them? So let's continue to move forward. For leaders leading an exhausted workforce, Goldman Sachs has something to say about this. And let's not forget this. I'm a CEO and I'm here to say, <laughs> We made 254 times more than the average worker. It's time to have a conversation, right? So why are people quitting? I want to hear from you. The answers are on the screen if you can see them. <laughs> Lack of childcare. Thank you. Well, yeah, sucks. Too hard. Oh, yeah. Where's the gratitude? Care. Say it again. Lack of care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Workplaces that don't uh, prioritize safety or care in their work. Right. No benefits. Awesome. The need for more control. Yeah. Control where? Anything. Yeah. OK. Gia. And I'm going to add. Um, those seem like all like negative reasons, like there's an absence of something. And then I think there's also the presence of opportunity right now because there are so many job openings, but there are also so many issues that have been revealed that people yeah. say, whoa, I want to go work on that yeah. because that is what's most important to our planet right now. Yeah, Jan, so the tight labor market has given workers more power to demand improvements in job quality. It's time for employers to listen, right? And so I promise I'm not here 
to depress you. I am here to then, for us, to collectively dream together. We have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to think about what our workplaces and spaces look like, feel like when you walk in, feel like when you're having crisis. We have that opportunity. We have plenty of headlines. I stopped. Well, I didn't stop here, but I'll go on in a moment. There's plenty of work out there to tell you why people have been unhappy, and it's really not that hard to figure out. So what can we do about it? I lead a nonprofit. Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, and I'll talk about the demographics of our nonprofit in a moment. And this is what we say, and this is what we say daily. Wherever you are on your journey, we have a place for you. That does not just mean the people we serve. That means the people who are on our team and who want to join our team. It's not an easy statement to live by, but we're doing it. And I'm not going to get into the details, this is shaded, but we're in lots of areas of work from housing to food security to recovery and healing. Many, many more areas. These are all them. I'll make sure you have the slides. Because in order to live by, we have a place for you. We have to create teams and those places. So during this time of those headlines, this is what has been going on in our organization. I joined the organization four years ago. I believe it was in June. It will be in June. I was about team number seven. Four years later, as of today, we're about 140 individuals. We're hiring about 30 more. I don't know where this growth will stop, but what I can tell you is that we don't have a workforce shortage issue. It's just not present. We're in some of the most rural areas in Maine. When we created the Center for Healing and Recovery in Millinocket, people said to me, are you nuts? Why Maine? I mean, why Millinocket? You need people who can work there, can live there. And I believe that Millinocket is a healing place. I believe that mountain is magical, it has sacred connections to us as Wabanaki people, and I believe those sacred connections are healing. And I believe that they're not just healing for indigenous people, I believe they're healing for all of you too. And so why Millinocket? Well, that's why. And I believe people will come, and they have. They've moved out of sunny Florida in January to Millinocket, Maine. People are moving from across the country to join this team. Our budget has also had to expand from less than a million to many, many, many million. 70% indigenous, not just Wabanaki, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy, but indigenous people, citizens from other tribal nations from across this land that have found us, that have left other parts of Maine in different systems of service, to come here. That is pretty exciting. What we've also found is that Wabanaki people live everywhere and that Wabanaki people are coming back to their homeland to be a part of this team. So these are not just indigenous people that have, you know, that you traditionally think about. These are indigenous people from everywhere. What I also want to say is, why haven't we had trouble? It, I don't believe it's just about the work we do and the sacred spaces we create that I'll talk about in a moment. I believe that we're actually hiring from our communities and people that have not been able to find jobs in the past. I have people that had trouble finding jobs in areas of Washington County, Maine, fully qualified. 
And why, you may ask, my only response to you is racism. Highly qualified people that are, actually some of them are on some of the boards of the organizations you lead. So, no problem finding workers. We also welcome people who are in recovery. We welcome people and interview people who are leaving incarceration. We believe in building team without judgment. We also believe that it's important that we have people of all ages, from young, young people to elders. The issues that we are all facing are far too complex to do it without every generation at the table. We all talk different, if you haven't noticed. We think different. We talk about taping rather than recording, right, Chan? It's different experiences lived. The other 30% of our organization is equally important. We're meant to be together. We're meant to be at the same tables, learning from each other's experiencing, asking questions, creating brave, courageous spaces. And that 30%, again, is amazingly diverse. We're proud of this. Indigenous communities are matriarchal. Women lead. We're leaders. Men serve a critical role as well, but women lead in our communities traditionally, as well as today. These are members of our team. Whether you want to go down the rapids of the sacred Penobscot River, go fiddleheading, which it's so close to that season, you all. <laughs> Enter ceremony, go pick sweet grass. We welcome families to our organization. I was telling some folks earlier that I'm proud that my mother works for the organization. I'm proud that my husband works for the organization. I'm proud that we have families in our organization of all generations. We believe in creating sacred spaces, sacred spaces for healing and the services we provide, but also sacred spaces for the people providing services, making sure that they're as well as they can be so they can provide that love and healing to the people we provide services to. So creating these spaces, where do people have in your spaces to breathe? Where are the places to stretch, to move, to get on a yoga ball if it's not in your office, to meditate if you need? Where are those spaces in the places that you all lead? If they're important enough to offer to others, for their healing, we need to be offering those spaces to the people, offering the healing. It all kind of makes sense. I welcome you to come visit any of our spaces. I think you'll be able to breathe differently after you walk in. Creating sacred structures and roles, this is our organizational chart. It's not intended for you to read it, it's intended to you, for you to see it's a circle. I'm not at the top, <laughs> I'm not even in the center. Because who leads the work? The people lead the work. The people that I lead, <laughs> lead the work. And so we're in lots of areas of work and also what I would hope that you would consider is that we don't just get people that come to us that are interested in a role or a job on our job board. What we encourage is that if you're interested in joining a team like this, we're interested in having a conversation. We're interested in seeing where your values and our values come together, where your dreams and our dreams can get further together, and then we create. So really building off the strengths of the people that are coming in, wanting everyone, quite frankly, to love their job. 
pulling people out of retirement like my mother because she loves what she does. I will quickly let you know there are many headlines that also say what employers can do. And employers are taking notice. How are you rede redesigning work and helping employees with that work-life balance? All questions for you to consider. Give your employees the gift of yoga, breath. Chi Willy one, I thank you. And thank you so much, Kathy, for keeping me on track. Can't wait to talk more. I want to thank everyone for I want to thank everyone for bearing with us as we get back into the in-person groove. Lisa, thank you. Thank you for giving us a vision of how systems might look different and some concrete ways of how to create those new more inclusive systems. And now it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce my friend and our colleague, Jennifer Hutchins. She is the executive director of Maine Association of Nonprofits, the state's leading organization for Maine charitable nonprofit sector organizations with more than 1,000 members from all 16 counties. Oh, sure. Prior to joining MAMP, Jen was the executive director of Creative Portland, where she led the city of Portland's efforts to strengthen the creative economy. Jen also served as director of communications and external affairs at the USM Muskie School of Public Service for nine years and as marketing director of Portland Stage Company from 1995 to 2000. After graduating from college, she worked for nonprofit and public institutions in Washington, D.C. and France. Jen has served on several boards during her career, currently at the Maine Academy of Modern Music, Go Ma'am, the Maine Philanthropy Center, and the USM Muskie School. In May of 2020, Jen was selected to serve on Governor Mills' Economic Recovery Committee, which was tasked with putting forth recommendations to alleviate the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the state's economy. Jennifer holds a master's in public policy and management and lives in Portland with her husband and two daughters. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Whew. Wow, feels like a had like a long drive to get here. <laughs> Took about two and a half years, in fact. Um, this is the second time that I've spoken in front of people live. Um, so uh, as Kathy has already mentioned, um, it's uh, um, something we all have to adjust to. So grace and space, my friends. <laughs> Asking for a lot of grace and space this morning. Um, really, really, really meaningful to me to see so many friends and colleagues out there in the, in the audience. And um, I'm really grateful for all of you being here and being in community with me this morning. Um, and thank you, Lisa. Where did you sit down? Oh, I'm oh, oh, she's standing. Okay. Thank you, Lisa, for providing such an inspiring model. For all of us, um, when uh, Kathy asked if I would be interested in speaking today, I um, was very much slightly intimidated by the prospect of the title Advancing Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Through Systemic Change in Communities and Across Sectors. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> sure, I'll step right into that one. <laughs> um, 
And, um, and, and one thing um, that I'm so grateful for, when Lisa, Kathy, and I met um, via Zoom a few weeks ago, was um, first thing Lisa said was, Jan, it's okay, we need you. That meant a lot. And uh, she said, the system wasn't for us, so we're just gonna build a new one. And she's modeling the way, and I'm just so grateful for her leadership and her generosity in sharing. So I'm gonna start with a story too. When I was in college, I um, was voluntold to become the president of my sorority. <laughs> Literally, they all turned and went, Jen should do it. And I went, what? And so not wanting to disappoint anyone and being a pleaser, I said, OK, I'll do that. And just a few weeks after that, my best friend, who is my best friend to this day, said, this sorority stuff is crap. I'm quitting. And I went, I agree with you. What the heck do I do now? I just signed up to be the president of this thing. It's now on my resume. <laughs> and you and I are having this conversation, bestie, and you're saying it's all crap. What do we do? And I didn't realize until recently that that's how I feel today. And at the time, and she and I have processed this over the years, I realized that her job was to get outside the system and start fighting. My job was to stay here and see what I could do. So here I am, surprisingly emotional, completely vulnerable to share with you some of the things I'm just thinking about as an individual leading an organization who I think has an opportunity to do some good things, to support work like Lisa's and countless other organizations in this state to make a difference. So I'm just gonna share with you some of my thoughts around that. I stayed president of my sorority I made some changes. We, we did a clothing gathering of all the Benetton sweaters. And yeah, I'm dating myself. Yeah. Benetton sweaters and took them to a community in Schenectady, New York, so that they would have um, clothing, extra clothing, instead of having a fraternity party where we had strawberry daiquiris and gave them out to 18-year-olds. <laughs> I tried. I did my little piece and I left. But I realized recently when I started our organization at the Maine Association of Nonprofits started looking hard at our internal selves, our personal experiences of what we really needed to start looking at to be genuinely engaged in the words on that screen. At first I thought, yeah, of course, right? Of course. I, I believe in all this stuff, you know? I'm into this. I can do this. And then I was handed a document with about 45 recommendations. And I went home that night and I cried. And I said, how can I possibly be part of a system that has done so much damage? How can I possibly I think I'm going to have to just leave. I'm going to have to follow my best friend's lead. And then she and others said, nope. And Lisa said, nope, we need you to stay. So bear with me. <laughs> and thank you all for being willing to do this with me. One of the helpful things for me in working on this, I'm just going to share some ideas, is to remind ourselves that what we mean by systemic change, and in particular, I'm centering um, racial equity, just for people to know context here. I'm centering racial equity in my comments, but, but uh, MAMP has uh, 
adopted, board and staff have adopted an equity commitment that is a broader inclusive, but we're centering racial equity. Um, I just wanted to share this. It sounds very academic, but again, I'm just trying to share with you how I've been trying to make sense of my role as an individual, my aspirations for how the power that I have at my, that I'm privileged to have, how I could start to begin to understand how I could have a role in our aspirations to, to be different systemically. And one of them is just reminding myself, and there are many different ways, if you, if you, many of you I know have done this work already, if, um, and so you probably think about it a little bit differently. There are many nuances to what we mean by levels of racism, but for the purposes of our conversation today, I wanted to just share with you the way I think about it. There's individual racism. There's the racism perpetuated by individual organizations. There's racism that's perpetuated then by institutions, and the difference there is that that's the partnership of organizations working together, collective action, collective impact is a term that many of you working in the nonprofit sector will be familiar with. That's an example of institutional system of organizations coming together and, and um, trying to solve a community problem together. And then there's the systemic or the structural. And this gets at those policies and practices that have been intentionally set up, um, in some cases very intentionally set up to leave out specific people of our humanity, common shared humanity on this earth. Some of them more directly racist than others, but that's the difference there. I share with you that one of the works, and I know many of you here are familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, the work of Kamara, jo Kamara Jones um, at the Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, we, um, I've had the opportunity to see her TEDx talk on allegories that she uses to talk about race and racism, and I was very moved and inspired by that. Um, just, I'm not gonna go into all of it, but I wanted to just those of you who have seen it remind you, or those of you who haven't, encourage you to remember her idea of a gardener's tale in terms of explaining systemic racism as when you put two of the same types of feeds, pink flowers in poor soil and red flowers in great soil simply because you prefer the red flowers, guess what's going to grow better? And then over time, you're justified because the red flowers grew better. And so you're able to say, look, it's a beautiful allegory that I found really, really helpful. Um, so then I wanna just share with you where uh, I'm thinking about where I'm currently most inspired with regards to how do you really do system change from within? How do I really think about marshalling my, what I can offer, my power and privilege and gifts? How can I do that? And right now I'm, I'm thinking a lot about an article that appeared in the Stanford Social Innovation Review by a woman, the CEO of BoardSource, uh, Ann Wallistad, and she wrote an article um, called The um, Four Principles of Purpose-Driven Leadership. And this is really focused on nonprofits and board leadership at nonprofits. And I, I really believe that, I, you know, one of the reasons why I came into the nonprofit sector was because I really did think it's, and I still do think it's the coolest sector. Because, yeah, woo, shout out. Um, I, I, there's no doubt that the system that set it up, set it up in a pretty kooky way. There's no doubt about it. When you look about at the history of how it came to be, I mean, it, it really is a corporate, I mean, nonprofits are corporations. So it comes right out of a profit-driven system. And it's really the place where 
all the work gets done that communities want to get done that I, for whatever reason, the private sector or the public sector aren't going to do. And those could be good reasons. I'm not, it's just the way it is. And yet we painfully know very little about it. You don't learn about it in high school. You might learn about it in college if you take the right classes. But it is an incredibly important sector, again, being inspired by Lisa's organization and the incredible work her team's doing. You can't deny the transformational capacity of the nonprofit sector to have the flexibility. I'm not going to deny the fact that I like the flexibility. I'm not going into the public sector anytime soon. That's harder work in some cases. I like the flexibility, but what I really love is the commitment to public benefit. And there's this term that we all throw around, and I should, I'm only going to speak for myself. I have thrown around many, many times the common good. The common good, my background, is, um, as Kathy said, was in marketing and communications. So always looking for that pithy sentence, right? That pithy thing that are going to get people motivated, empowering people with purpose, championing the common good. When I got that report two years ago, I said, what a load of crap. What people? Who defined common good? What's the actual substance behind those headlines and that commitment? Can I do this? I'll get up a shot. I thought a lot about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's not the state of Massachusetts. It's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Why did they set it up that way? Why is there a common green? What do all those things mean? And how do they show up in our society? And what are the systemic things that we need to really start having really important conversations about, as Kathy and Jan have invited us to do today? So um, I'm going to um, finish by just sharing with you the four principles that Anne is offering that because nonprofits are so awesome, because we have the capacity to commit and really fully embrace the public benefit aspect of our mission, we can, we actually can chip away at some of those systemic pieces that were built up that aren't helpful and we can shift the rules and make more space and try th different things. And um, purpose for board organization is one of those things. This is based on some research that board, board source did, 800 CEOs of nonprofits, and it was leading with intent was the report, and found that most boards are set up as fundraising boards. And that has always been the champion best practice, right? got to have a board that knows how to fundraise, fundraisers, fundraisers, fundraisers. The problem with that is that very quickly your board loses touch with the purpose and it becomes more money for the sake of more money or for the sake of the sustainability of the organization. Not necessarily reminding ourselves, wait, wait, well, wait. Why did a bunch of community people come together and decided this work needed to happen in our community X many years ago? And have we made progress on that? Oh, and by the way, where are the people who we made the progress for at the decision-making table? Purpose for four organization, not the organization to exist itself, is one aspiration of a purpose-driven board. Respect for the ecosystem we are not alone. We are not independent nonprofits trying to do this work together. We know we are all connected. We know we all depend on each other. There is no nonprofit in this state that doesn't depend on another organization to realize the impact that they want to have on public benefit. Ecosystem, we rely, we support, we need to, and we've been asked to exist in a system that makes us compete with one another. It's maddening. It is challenging. 
but we can figure out how to do it. Respect for the ecosystem. At the board level, remember, I'm not talking about having an enlightened CEO. I'm talking about having an enlightened CEO and a team run by a board if that's the way you're going to choose to set yourself up. Equity mindset, that's putting equity, and in our case at MAP, racial equity, at the center of what you do. Heather McGee, if you're not familiar with Heather McGee's work, some of us, she really, really helped me understand how we can put, if we center those who have the, been disadvantaged the most, the rest of us will also benefit. It is not a zero-sum game. It is not a zero-sum game. It is not about slicing the pie more thinly. It is about throwing the pie out and sharing. Sharing the full panoply of what we have to offer with one another. And authorized voice and power. Most of the boards that were, um, had, um, did not have any diversity of any kind, particularly racial diversity. And I'm proud to report that increasingly in the nonprofit sector, there's a lot of awareness around how to change this and a lot of um, willingness to learn and listen and figure this out. But I think it bears repeating that who actually has the power to make the decisions about these community-based organizations, right? I'm gonna stop there. Um, thank you all, I'm really, really grateful for you letting me just share with you my thoughts and I appreciate all of you, thank you. So, what, what we would like to do now is have the self-appointed or the volunteer from each group come up and just share two or three key takeaways from the discussion. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Rick, Rick has been voluntold, basically. Good morning, Rick Dorian. I'm the executive director of the Vane Children's Home. Uh, as Kathy said, I was voluntold. I stood up at the, uh, depending how you look at it, the right or really wrong moment. Um, I did take a few notes. We had some really dynamic conversation. Uh, one point was a lot of things begin with a board. They need to know their purpose and their role to be an ally and a leader and a partner in these conversations. Um, I'm sort of pulling these together for our staff and our teams and our coworkers need to know their roles, they need flexibility, and they need to know about opportunity. I love this. Uh, Lisa said that they, they don't plan for today or the next hour. They do seventh generation thinking. So they're not worried about just the next payroll or the next fiscal year, but well into the future. Um, and also, I love this, came from Colleen. Um, we were talking about living wages, and MIT, I guess, has a calculator to look at what that actually is that's completely unbiased, so. I really appreciate it, Rick. Thank you. And then, uh, is there? Great. If you can introduce yourself. It's on my phone. I'm not. <laughs> sure. Hi, Chandra Leister, and today I'll be singing. No. Um, okay. So our group talked about. Oh, um, I am here representing the Maine Track Club, uh, a fitness uh, running organization that organizes a variety of races, um, such as the Maine Marathon, which is a nonprofit that benefits nonprofits. Ooh. Run today. Um, but uh, what we talked about is uh, board 
and volunteer diversity and how we can ensure that people are, aren't taken advantage of um, and maybe feel like they are serving privileged other board members. Um, and also uh, what it would be like to acknowledge the power and privilege of volunteers and identify that it's hard to break into that and that sometimes board membership may require a certain amount of fundraising or a certain amount of, you know, board donations um, and how do we push back for funders that are looking for full board fundraising participation to ensure that we have economic diversity on boards. Does that sound like the things that we talked about? I would like to fully uh, acknowledge and appreciate that I've missed things because my typing is bad, um, but thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, and I'm, I don't know your name. Chadra, please, sir. Chadra, thank you, Chadra. You were also kind of voluntold, so we really appreciate it. Thank you all for your energy, for participating fully. To those of you joining us uh, via the recording, we, we want to hear your ideas too. This is, we hope, just the beginning of our JEDI work together. And the six speakers who helped um, not only facilitate over the course of the three JEDI symposiums that we've had over the last three months, to a person have said that they are interested in this being an ongoing effort. We have a golden opportunity, a once in seven generations opportunity. The world has been remade right, over the last two years. So let's seize this opportunity. Let's continue to work together. Um, we, are, we have a survey that I will ask you, beg you to take the time to fill out either um, before you leave, you can fill it out on your phone, I'm gonna show you the link, or I will also have the link in the follow-up email that I send out after this event. Um, and one of the questions in that survey is, would you want to continue participating in ongoing JEDI efforts? Our hope is to formulate a cadre of leaders in Maine and make Maine a model and an inspiration of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive economy and culture. We can do it. We can do it. And so I also want to thank our event sponsors, Bangor Savings Bank, Main Biz, Woodard and Curran, and it's on auto. Here's the survey. <laughs> thank you for joining us. So what um, we're, we just want to pitch, the applications are being accepted right now for the next classes of both ICL, the Institute for Civic Leadership, and Leadership Maine and nominations are being accepted. So all of you who have been through both or one of the programs, you know how life and career changing it is. Please nominate. If each of you nominated one person, those classes will fill up and then we continue to create this cadre of leaders for not only this work, but all of the work that we are approaching together. Plus, as you know as alums, the support network, the peer support, and how you learn and respectfully challenge each other in your work and in your communities. So please nominate. If you are a business, please send someone to either ICL or Leadership Maine. And all of these links will be in the follow-up email that I send out, as well as the recordings. It will likely be, instead of my usual 24 hours over the last two years, uh, the follow-up email will likely be next Tuesday or Wednesday because I'll have the links to the recording as well. Thank you all. Onward and upward. And there's one thought that we were just talking about in the lobby with one of the participants. A lot of this JEDI work, it, is, oh, it can be overwhelming. And so I constantly remind myself, my children, my husband and all of you, we teach our children to chunk things out, right? 
If you're learning how to read, chunk out the word, right? Take it in small steps if you need to. And so I will close with a quote. When we're approaching this work, changing a system, changing thousands of years of bias and discrimination feels overwhelming. So on the days when it feels overwhelming, think of one thing, one step you can take as an individual, as an organization, in your community or systemically. Courage is not always roar, uh, roar it, cor courage doesn't always roar like a lion. Sometimes it's the quiet voice in your head saying, I will try again tomorrow. Thank you, we'll see you all soon. Great to see you in person.